This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Hey, buddy, just wanted to say thanks again for the awesome job you did Friday morning. That was great. Just uh, started out our day perfectly and put a cap on our event. I just thought it was awesome, man. You did a great job. But even more than that, just appreciate your spirit in the room, man. Seem like you're uh, just more alive and just more enthusiastic than ever about things you're working on and things the family's doing. So I just want you to know I appreciate you, man. Travel safe. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1945. We have got a returning guest back on the show today, and that is none other than the Fed guy, Joseph Wang is back with us sharing some fantastic insights. He'll be here on the next episode as well, because this is a long discussion. <laughs> but there's some really good stuff, some real gems and nuggets in here as to understanding the way monetary policy impacts you as investors and what it means to your overall financial health and your financial future, most importantly. Two things to say before we get to the interview with Joseph Wang, and that is number one, housing inventory. Just wanted to share this with you quickly. I won't even show you the chart on it. You've seen it so many times, but I wanted to give you the latest numbers. And the latest numbers are 490,000. 490,000 homes on the market for sale in the United States. And the question is always compared to what? Well, back in 2015, we had more than double that, about 1.2 million houses on the market. And at the lowest point, compared to what, right? When the market was absolutely psychotic, crazy, you couldn't buy a house no matter what. <laughs> I mean, it was like impossible to buy a house, basically, right? We had a low of 293,000. So we've tracked this inventory for you. We report it pretty much every single week, especially when there are changes. But inventory is down. It was higher just two weeks ago. So we're seeing lower inventory as we move into the new year. Let's see how that pans out as time goes on. But again, remember my metaphor or analogy. I don't know. I guess it's kind of both. You know, there is a slight difference between those two. And frankly, off the top of my head, because I've only had one cup of coffee today, I can't remember. <laughs> got to have two cups to remember that. But it's the sink, right? So we've got the faucet on is new properties coming into the market. The water in the sink is the amount of existing inventory. And the drain, the water going out the sink, is the amount of absorption of that inventory or that water in this case, because that is how many people are buying these properties. How quickly are buyers absorbing the inventory, right? Constantly adding to inventory with new properties on the market, current inventory, and then inventory being absorbed, moving out of the market, meaning properties selling. That is the best way to look at the market. I think really that's how you need to look at it. So just keep that in mind. And what we have right now is we have a reasonable amount of new home inventory coming into the market, especially higher price new home inventory that isn't really interesting to us as investors because it's too expensive and the rent to value ratios aren't that great on those higher price properties. Very little, just a trickle, a trickle, a tiny trickle of entry level or lower price properties coming into the sink, coming onto the market. And that is meaning that that inventory is especially low, much lower than the overall inventory numbers would indicate because it's just a small 
percentage of that overall inventory. And then we have the existing inventory made up of resale properties and new properties. And then we have the buyers absorbing a blend of the two. But the odd thing now, and the thing that, I don't know, in my long career doing this, I can never remember a time when it has been true the way it is today. And that is that we have so little resale inventory. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's okay because I like buying new homes better. Okay, sure, that's fine that you say that. But the problem is the new homes are much more expensive properties because you can't build an entry-level new house anymore. <laughs> the, the government has essentially made it illegal to build an entry-level new house anymore, right? So you can get close to it. You can buy below the median price in a given market, but you've got to just notice that there is very, very little inventory available in that entry level housing market. So it's a very unusual situation. We have a very mixed situation, but we will keep reporting on that. And, you know, I used to always say, and I know you like this saying because many of you have repeated it back to me. You email me and you, you repeat the saying back in your email. It says, I love your saying, Jason. It's an amazing time to be alive. And, you know, I didn't say that very much at all for the last couple of years. Why? Well, we were in the middle of that Cervasa sickness going around, and we all realized after a while it was just a big scam. The people promoting that scam should be indicted for crimes against humanity. They are literally responsible for the deaths of potentially millions and millions of people and it is so unfortunate and not only the direct deaths remember the way that affected all of us the way that just increased the loneliness epidemic the drug addiction problem every addiction you can imagine under the sun increased in that dysfunctional environment that the powers that be put us into. So it's a very sad thing that they did to so many people, restricting their behavior, restricting their freedom, restricting their ability to socialize and so forth. But look, notwithstanding all of that. So I really stopped saying it was an amazing time to be alive because I just felt that we were all so taken and not in a good way taken, in a very bad way, taken advantage of during that time. But something has changed, and you might know what I'm alluding to. Just a little over a month ago, there was a major, major change that is as big as probably any revolution you can think of. That's my prediction. A monumental tectonic shift that could make it, once again, a truly amazing time to be alive. Maybe the most amazing time to be alive ever in human history, if it works out for the good. But it might not work out for the good. And I just can't wait to talk to you a lot, a lot. I'm going to talk a lot about this at our upcoming Empowered Investor Live event in Scottsdale, Arizona. So hopefully you have your tickets uh, for that. Go to empoweredinvestor.com slash live or jasonhartman.com. Get your tickets. We're going to sell out for that pretty soon. We probably got about 30 tickets left. And why do I say probably about? Because, well, I don't know the exact numbers that have registered at the moment offhand. But number two is it depends on the mix of tickets, whether people buy those elite tickets or the general admission tickets with like a different allocation available. VIP sold out already, but you can get a general ticket. Those are a good bargain or an elite ticket if you want the coaching and stuff included with it. So we will look forward to seeing you at Empowered Investor Live. And let's get to our interview with Joseph Wang, the Fed guy. It is my pleasure to welcome Joseph Wang back to the show. He was on several months ago and he is back. He's known as the Fed guy. He's the author of Central Banking 101. And the Fed is arguably the biggest investor in the world. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I think they are. And Joseph used to be a senior trader at their trading desk. So he had access to a lot of data and just a lot of interesting insights on things. Welcome back. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to have you. So are they the biggest investor in the world? Yeah, yeah, they are. They have, yeah. uh, you know, let's say 
say seven trillion dollars in assets. You can think of it. Some people describe them as the world's largest investment fund because yeah. they basically print money and they buy assets and they're ginormous. Yeah, and yeah, it's, that's it's a bit different though because if you're the Fed, you're not trying to make money, and that really changes everything. Um, because if you're not trying to make money and just trying to shape um, policy, then you you buy no matter what the price is. So why would you say they're not trying to make money? I mean, when the Fed in deploys its printed capital <laughs> to uh, to invest, why wouldn't it want to have those investments grow? Yeah. So because you're you're doing something different when you're the Fed. So if you're a private investor like me and you, we're buying something hoping that in the future it would appreciate and they will we'll make a little bit more money off that that. But when you're at the Fed, you're not trying to make money. You don't need to make money. You can just print all you want. What you're trying to do is influence interest rates and thus ultimately influence economic conditions. So the Fed is in charge of, um, let's say, inflation. Its its goal is to have full employment and stable prices. The way it goes about doing that is by changing interest rates, by influencing interest rates. And the way it goes about influencing interest rates is going out and buying a lot of securities. Now, if you go out and buy, let's say, five trillion treasury securities, it sounds reasonable that the yield for those for those treasury securities will go lower. So you're right. influencing interest rates, hoping to influence the real economy. You're not trying to make money. That's basically how they do. That's how they operate. So a couple of things in your bio I just want to ask you about, and some of these may be very elementary, but I just want to make sure that everybody can kind of understand this. Okay, so, you know, it says Joseph spent five years studying the plumbing of the financial system as a senior trader on the open markets desk. The desk sits at the center of the dollar system as its ultimate and infinite provider of dollars. So tell us about the desk, if you will. How many people are at that desk at the Fed? Uh, you know, you you worked there, and how how many other traders were there? Yeah, so the desk is the Fed's trading desk. So the way that the Fed is organized is that it you have the Washington D.C., which is the Board of Governors, which is the center of power for the Federal Reserve System. But you also have all these different reserve banks, um, Reserve Bank in New York, Reserve Bank in Chicago, and so forth. Yeah, but 12, the Fed, twelve of them, right? Yeah, so. If the Fed wants to go and actually do something, the markets, it asks its trading desk to do that. There's only one trading desk and it sits in New York. So when you're thinking about the Fed going out and doing quantitative easing, buying trillions of dollars, that's done by the desk. If you're thinking about the Fed giving emergency loans to foreign central banks through the FX swap lines, that's also done by the desk. So since basically all this is done by the desk, I think of the desk as basically where the money printer resides. Now, they don't decide how much they print or who they lend to. That comes from DC. But the actual implementation of actually printing and the lending, that's done by people on the open markets desk. The desk probably has, a, uh, I don't know, probably 100 people. I, I, oh, wow. So it's pretty big. So it's yeah. not just, we, we had, so we had the head office in New York, but also a satellite office in Chicago. So uh, what happened was that in New York City, there was a huge hurricane um, let's say 10 years ago, and that basically flooded all of downtown Manhattan. And then the Fed realized, you know, the world might, might not like it if the Fed went offline and we couldn't be doing all these things in the markets. So we just set up a satellite office in Chicago, kind of as a way of insurance instead of any, in case anything happened to the main office in New York, we'd also have a satellite office in Chicago. So jo Joseph, have I have to say, I beg to differ with you on that one. Some people might really like it if the Fed went offline. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't. The stock market would go to zero or something like that. It's, yeah. it's not good. And that would really hurt interest rates too and everything like that. But the desk also does something else. And that is that they act as the eyes and ears of the Fed. So for example, let's say you're Jay Powell or someone sitting on the FOMC and you you see the stock market crashing or you see interest rates wobbling around and you want to figure out well, what's driving this. So when that happens, what you do is you ask the open markets desk to go and find out for you. So people on the traders, like what I used to be, would go and they would look through data. The Fed has tremendous amounts of confidential data as to what's going on. That's actually the next thing I was going to ask you about. But is more importantly, though, beyond that, is that they actually have relationships throughout the financial community. So if you're the Fed and you call a bank, they have to pick up. So the Fed can basically call any of the big banks. They, they have relationships with a whole bunch of big hedge funds and foreign central banks, foreign investors, and so forth. 
Now, those guys, they don't have to pick up, but they want they usually want to have a relationship with the Fed. So you can talk to all these people on a confidential basis to get their views as to what's happening in the markets. Then you take that and you can basically report on up to, to, to let the Fed know, more important people know what's going on. So it's a really, really good way to understand. Is to, it's kind of like a peek behind the curtain to help people understand just what's going on in the financial system and how it works together. Looking on in your bio, and I wanted to ask you about the data, right? So it says, the desk has access to virtually all regulatory and financial data, as well as open lines of communication with all major market participants, right? Which you just yep. alluded to all of that. When we talk about the data that the Fed has access to, I mean, all of us have access to just a, a monumental amount of economic reports. What don't we know? I, I mean, maybe that'd be an impossible question to answer, but like, what are there some sort of broad things that just the general public does not know or have access to? I mean, yeah, we, we're not privy to those conversations with the banks and the hedge fund managers, like you mentioned, but is there, you know, sort of like privately published data of some sort? I'm sure there is. Like, what, what yeah, don't so we know? I think for the most, for the, for the typical investor, the type of data that they have is, is, you know, as good as the Fed has. So, so to be clear, let, let's say that you're, do, let's say, for example, we publish things like, uh, so the U.S. government publishes things like, um, you know, employment data and so forth. That's that's really uh, market moving. And so the Fed would have really good stuff on that. They have internal models that can generate predictions based on that. But, you know, I think what matters to most investors is what does the future look like? And so it's not so much the data itself, but how you interpret that data. And so there, I don't think the Fed has any edge in that. But from markets in particular, some of the best confidential data they have has to do with what the banks are doing and what particular market participants are doing. Um, I'll give you an example. If you are a bank, obviously you're making a whole bunch of loans and you you have liabilities you're borrowing from people and you're making loans. The Fed has a lot of insight into what kind of assets a bank holds and how it's going about to fund those assets. In fact, they actually have a team at every major bank sitting within the bank, basically giving real-time, um, I guess, compliance monitoring to, to regulations and so forth. Mm -hmm. Another place the Fed would have really good insight is, um, let's say, some markets like, say, the treasury market or, say, the repo market where they have a lot of data and they can kind of see who's buying and who's selling and, and why. So the data collection is not perfect, but it's much better than what you would get as a private investor. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. So talk to us a little bit about the repo market, if you would, and what's going on with the repo market. George, our friend, was doing a lot of content on that back in 2019 in the pre-COVID era. Bring us up to date. Yeah, so I, George is a big fan of the repo market. He's done some great videos on it. So the repo market, just for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a market where you take U.S. treasuries and basically pawn them out for cash, like an overnight loan. So let's say I have a billion dollars in worth of treasuries, and for whatever reason, I need some cash. So what I could do is I can instantly borrow against them in the repo market for a very low interest rate. Uh, one of the ways that I like to think of this is that it makes treasuries very cash-like. So if you have U.S. treasuries and you can turn, turn them into cash at very low interest rates anytime you want, then, you know, that makes your treasuries really cash-like. It fundamentally changes, actually, everything in the financial system because if treasuries are cash-like, then when the U.S. government is doing a tremendous amounts of deficit spending, then they're kind of basically printing money. But uh, aside from that, the repo market has been just total, totally boring, totally sleepy. Um, the reason being is that there's just a lot of cash in the financial system right now trying to um, find a place to go. And, you know, repo is a very safe place to do that. So you have a lot of cash sitting in the in the um, money market space ready to invest in repo. Uh, so much so that they, uh, they're just parking all that excess cash at the Fed right now. There's $2 trillion in the reverse repo facility, which you can think of as kind of a checking account for money market funds. Right. So, if you're a money market fund and you have a lot of cash and you don't know what to do with it, you just deposit it at the Fed in what's called the reverse repo facility. Mm -hmm. And if, um, so right now the reverse repo facility is yielding like 3.8%. If a private investor wanted to borrow in repo at even 3.81%, so a difference of uh, like one basis point, then you'd have a money market fund take money out of the Fed's reverse repo facility and just lend it to them. 
that all two trillion then is kind of weighing down repo rates. It's basically putting a pretty big ceiling on on as to where they can go. And so that's what's making the market really sleepy. And I expect that to continue for at least another year. Can you give us, and I don't know how much you were following it back then, but some contrast into what was going on in late 2019, because there was a lot of talk about the repo market back then being in crisis and, you know, what the implications uh, for that were. And, you know, some were sounding alarm bells saying it was, you know, could crash. Yeah, that was definitely a crisis back then. So I'll just give some context in, in 2019. It was um, September back then. So repo rates usually were about 2% there, plus or minus a you know, fraction of a basis, a fraction of a percent. And um, in, in, uh, in mid-September, when the repo market basically crashed, the interest rates went intraday up to as high as almost 9%, 10% before, before coming back down. And that's really unusual because you expect repo to be very sleepy, about 2% every day. It can be a crisis because a lot of people are basically uh, borrowing in repo and buying those treasuries. So, you know, basically classic uh, borrow short, lend long. So, and that's fine, except that one day if your funding costs go way high, I mean, if you're a real estate investor, you can think of it as being on a variable mortgage and suddenly your variable mortgage rates spike and then, whoa, you can't afford it anymore. You have to fire sell your real estate assets. Well, welcome perhaps. to 2005. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that was why it was such a problem. Um, but so the Fed saw that and they immediately went in and did some emergency lending operations. They were willing to basically lend infinite amounts of money into the repo market and that quieted it down. Uh, there's a really good question as to why that the rate spiked a lot that time. The reason from my perspective is that basically you had a lot of people who were hedge funds who were borrowing the repo market. They were borrowing a lot, uh, steadily increasing, but the lenders in that market, they were the commercial banks and they were slowly uh, running out of money to lend, so to speak, because of quantitative tightening. And so when you have tremendous amounts of demand that's growing met with a decreasing supply of funds, then sometimes accidents happen. You hit an air pocket, as they would say in markets and mm -hmm. rates spike. So I don't think the repo market could spike this time around. That's basically impossible because you have $2 trillion left in the reverse repo facility. But what you could see a spike though is just treasury yields in general. And maybe we've kind of seen some of that um, earlier in the year and in the UK as well, when you had the UK um, gilt market, basically just gilt yield spike higher in a span mm -hmm. of a day. Okay. So in talking about your book a little bit, I like how you divide it up. You talk about types of money and then, you know, the money creators and then the shadow banks. And, you know, I just like to, you know, if you can take people through kind of these three sort of broad categories and how that plumbing works, if, if you would, you know, the, the, the types of money, you know, that, that's an important thing to consider, whether you're talking about, you know, the bank reserves, deposits, treasuries, you know, cash, yeah. fiat money. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. And it's the key to understanding why, for example, why quantitative easing wasn't really inflationary. You have to understand what money is. I think the key insight that I would offer is that what money is, really depends on who you are in the financial system. For example, let's say you're a retail mom and pop. What you think of as money are basically what you have in a bank. So they're bank deposits. However, if you're a bank, what you think of as money is different. What you think of as money are deposits at the Federal Reserve. This is um, These are called reserves. And if you're a huge institutional investor, let's say you have a billion dollars to manage, what you think of as money is different as well. You can't think of as money as if you have a billion dollars, you can't deposit it at a commercial bank. Why? Well, the bank could go under. You're taking credit risk. So what you think of as money is actually uh, like treasury securities, debt issued by the government because the government has a printing press. They can't go bankrupt. So these are different types of money, say bank deposits, reserves, treasury securities, and they all interact in the financial system. Just as a way to illustrate this, Let's think about quantitative easing. During quantitative easing, the Fed went out. They bought several trillion dollars worth of treasury securities. They printed a lot of money to buy those securities. 
And many people were looking at this in 2009, 2008, and thinking that we would have imminent hyperinflation. But what they misunderstood, though, is that the Fed was printing all this money, these were reserves, and using the proceeds of that money to buy treasury securities, which is another type of money. So it's like printing $100 to buy another $100. The amount mm -hmm. of money in the system didn't really change, just the composition of it. The non-Fed community had fewer reserves, but more treasuries. It's a change in composition rather than quantity. And because of that, there really wasn't any inflation stemming from this massive printing. But what there was, though, and this is exactly as the Fed intended, was inflation in asset prices. This is because that money is not, even though, let's say, bank deposits, reserves, and treasuries are all money-like, they're not perfect substitutes. Let's go back. If you're a huge investor, suddenly, instead of having, let's say, a billion dollars in treasuries, you ended up with a billion dollars in bank deposits. Bank deposits give you 0% yield, and they have credit risk. You can't take credit risk or you need a little bit more yield. Maybe you go out and you buy Apple bonds, or maybe you go out and you buy uh, the S&P. So you have this brief portfolio reshuffling that makes asset prices go higher. And of course, makes real estate go higher as well, because on margins, some people shift out and they buy real assets. I'm almost surprised that you don't have listed here credit as a type of money. If you're a commercial bank, now this is something that many people don't realize is that if you're a commercial bank, when you're making loan, when you're creating credit, you're also creating money. So if I'm an investor and I go to a bank and I ask for a loan, then what the bank does is that they basically create money out of thin air. It's based on credit, basically. So if you look at the bank's balance sheet, and I know this is a real estate investor heavy channel, so many people are familiar with the balance sheet concept. If I go to a bank and ask for a loan for a million dollars, what happens on the bank's balance sheet? The bank's balance sheet actually creates an asset loan to me out of thin air and then goes to its liabilities and creates a million dollars in deposits to my checking account. It expands its balance sheet and creates deposits out of thin air. So then when I log into the bank's accounting system, I can see a million dollars has been basically added to my account digitally. So that is credit-based money, and it's what underlies the vast majority of what we think of as money. So if you look at the financial system, almost, uh, let's say, the vast majority of money, things that we think of as money, are bank deposits, and that's backed by credit, a loan that the bank made. In consideration how money is created out of thin air and so forth, you know, there, there's a whole group of people that think deficits don't matter, Debt doesn't matter. Modern monetary theory or MMT is the answer, right? We've got to stop worrying about all this stuff and just spend as much money as we want. Is that actually possible? <laughs> I, I know my you answer. Know, that, was, <laughs> that was a reasonable way of thinking about the world before 2021. And uh, mm. to be honest, those people, those MMT people, the, their, their understanding of the world isn't incorrect. It's just that they're they're not being honest in how they implement it. So at a Tell high level, me. what the MMT people are saying is that, well, the government really isn't constrained by its deficit. Right. It can print and spend money. Its only real constraint is real resources. Let's say that, for example, the government prints a billion dollars and spends it. Now, if you have factories that are not at capacity, then you can go and you can spend that billions of billion dollars and the factory will produce more stuff, but there won't be inflation because they were, under, they were operating at below capacity. And that was kind of the world that we were living in before 2020. So we had a world where uh, there's a whole lot of excess capacity in the world. So I mean, the MMT people were saying things like basically you can print and spend and all that extra money will go and just make uh, the factories work up to capacity, it wouldn't cause inflation. And, you know, because the factories are producing more, you'd actually have more economic growth. And I, I don't think they were wrong in that. Where they are dishonest, though, is that they didn't follow their own advice. What they said was the real constraint to, any, to money printing is the capacity of the economy to produce, which is to say inflation. Now, going back to that example that I just mentioned, let's say you printed a billion dollars and you went and buy stuff, you went to go and buy stuff. But the factories, they were already operating at excess capacity. So you're basically trying to buy stuff from a factory. The factory can't produce anymore, so prices go higher. You get inflation. Now, in this world, what the MMT people had said was that, well, 
now we're at capacity, so we shouldn't be spending anymore. But they're not going to say that, obviously. They're going to say that, well, we got to spend even more so we can build new factories. So they're basically dishonest people that um, will say anything to get the government to spend money. So <laughs> yeah. they, uh, it's not that their theory is, is wrong of how the world works. It's just that they're not implementing it. And, I, I just think it, it's kind of like living in fantasy land. <laughs> how can that work? I mean, you know, capital formation comes from actual work and labor right. and or thinking, which is also work and labor. And you form capital and you deploy capital and you invest it and it creates wealth. And that's how a society and an economy grow. But to me, that's just common sense. But what's interesting about the MMT crowd and also the history of the Federal Reserve in parallel with the IRS, of course, we all know the Federal Reserve was created and all like almost immediately after that, the IRS was created because when you create money out of thin air, if you have the ability to loan it to foreign countries and the ability to tax your own population and require that they pay you in the same money you create and require that the debts loaned to foreign countries be repaid in the same dollar that you created, then you create demand for your own currency. That seems like an awfully awesome ecosystem for, you know, I wish I could do that because that's a great trick. That's where the MMT crowd kind of does make sense. I, I mean, I'm not saying that system is right. I'm just saying it works, you know? Yeah, yeah. So one of the ways that they would talk about uh, their prescriptions for high inflation, for example, is to raise taxes because what happens then uh, you're basically the government is taking in money and reducing the amount of money in, in the economy by taxes. And so that slows down inflation. I think that that actually would work. Let's say, for example, we have high inflation today. What if the government raised tax rates to 80 percent? Then everyone will suddenly have a lot less money and it'll be sent to the government who would uh, assuming they just they, let's assuming they're paying down their deficit so then there's less spending power that people have then inflation will come down because you just don't have enough money to spend um, but in practice that's never how it operates it's hard to cut taxes so yeah right it, taxes it, it, never go down they only go up <laughs> overall it seems yeah like. yeah yeah oh uh, we, we've had a good run in the u.s for the past two decades i mean they were really higher earlier and but i think yeah. we're, we are probably moving into a world where taxes are, are going to be higher simply because the politics behind it we're yeah. um just uh, more populous, I guess. So it's yeah. more. Well, just a... speaking to that, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on this because I, I want to ask you about what's to come and what your thoughts are for the future. That's what's really what people want to know. But this is a great education. But, you know, before the Reagan Tax Act, I mean, of course, marginal tax rates were dramatically higher. But, you know, there were all kinds of ways you could reduce your effective tax bill back then. And, you know, that's what spurred all this investing into crazy things that don't work like windmills. And imagine <laughs> that we've got windmills back again. <laughs> you know, you know. But, but you're saving the economy. That's priceless. It's worth yes, everything. <laughs> yes, you're saving the environment. Yes, yes, sure. Even though those are huge environmental polluters. But that's exactly a takes tremendous amounts of resources iron oh, yeah. and stuff it's, like that it's yeah. just it's just Crazy. silly this is all silliness you know it, it, it's just silly okay so just quickly though before we get to predictions about what's coming or at least thoughts on what's coming the fed the commercial banks and the treasury those are the money creators how do they work together yeah when they work together they're they're freely all forms of money are freely convertible with each other so if i have a bank deposit i can easily go and i can buy a treasury or if I have a bank deposit, I can easily go to a bank and ask the bank to um, convert that to currency, so a piece of paper. So when that happens, you know, money is money, and everyone, if everything works well. But if you have a time when these different types of money can't be converted, then you can easily lead to panic, and that leads to a lot of disruption. Now, I'll give a couple examples. So the classic panic, of course, is if you have a bank deposit, but you can't convert that to currency. So you show up at a bank, you ask to withdraw money because you want some currency. Yep. The bank says, you know, I don't have any currency. That's what James <laughs> Stewart says, and it's a wonderful life, right? Yeah. <laughs> movie, yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, you have tremendous panics. So that actually used to happen a lot throughout the history of the U.S. So right. 
a bank would run out of currency, everyone would think that the bank is going under, then you could have long lines outside of the bank, everyone trying to withdraw. And the bank, which actually was in good condition, suddenly is in bad condition because they have to fire sell some assets to make uh, those withdrawals. And then, you know, that's bad for the economy, bad for the markets. And we'll be back with a lot more on this topic with this guest on our next episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.